Okay, so today we're going to be talking about um, spatial registration, which is uh, a topic that um, uses like uh, spatially resolved transcriptomic data, basically is like a method to um, match different features, whether it's like um, clusters um, in like new spatial transcriptomic data or like cell type populations. And it like basically matches those back to a reference um, spatial and like spatial annotations in like a reference data set. So that's like the overarching idea. So we can go over a little bit of background. Um, so we're going to be using a lot of tools from spatial LABD today um, and also some other LABD data. Um, we can go over some background. Um, so yeah, uh, let's start here. So you guys might be familiar with um, uh, Kristen's paper, the Mannered et al. Uh, Nature Neuroscience paper that had um, the, the first round of spatial uh, transcriptomics with Visium in the DLPFC. Um, so basically spatial transcriptomics mapping gene expression to each of these Visium spots on this slide. Um, is there anybody super unfamiliar with that that maybe wants to go over more details? Um, but basically, the idea is that like there's this slide with I forget how many spots, but basically these charged spots with the barcodes. Actually, maybe I'll just pull up the actual slide for this. Um, basically, this slide and they have these charged spots with the barcodes, and then you put the piece of tissue physically on, um, and then you like rinse it so that these barcodes. Uh, stick to the, or like, um, are added to the pieces of RNA that are in that spot on the tissue. So basically, and then we sequence that, and then we can match those barcodes back to where they were on this slide. And so we know where certain genes were expressed in the tissue. And we can do stuff like this, where it's like, we know MVP was expressed down here and less up here. Um, and PCP4 um, here and not here. So we, we know where certain genes were expressed in the two-dimensional space on the tissue. That's like the overarching concept of that tech. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? Yeah. What's the cellular resolution? It's not one single cell. How many cells do you capture? No, for Visium, it's not. It's um, I think the average is three, but it, it, change, it varies based on like, um, uh, what types of cells, because uh, cells in the brain are, can be very different sizes. So the median is like three. So we are capturing multiple cells and maybe multiple cell types. Okay. Um, I think they're hoping to get this down to one or like one cell, but uh, this the tech that we use in this project is not there yet. Um, Do you know how many microns it is specifically or? Uh, I'm pretty sure these are five microns across, like a diameter of five microns. 55 microns or five? 55 microns. Okay. Uh, Anthony clarified in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> That's um, bigger than it would be, but uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that like there is an effort to get them smaller and like down to like one cell or like, you know, even less than one cell resolution. But uh, this is what we're working with here. Um, and then, all right. Uh, is everybody? good on this concept. Um, all right, so um, yeah. So basically um, uh, there was work done at where that was uh, 12 of the DLPFC. And at this time, basically the DLPFC has six uh, distinct histological layers and white matter. So there's like gray matter in the brain and then white matter. And then the gray matter is made of six layers. And this is like a pretty like, uh, I guess like classic ana an 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 anatomy of this, um, of this brain region. Um, so in this project, um, Kristen and other people in the imaging team like went through and manually labeled all of the spots in these samples, which was a lot of work. And they produced these very beautiful images. This one specifically is like a famous, <laughs> famous slide, if you've seen any other methods that have to do with spatial transcriptomics, you probably will see this sample pop up because it is quite nice. Um, so basically we have 
12 DLPFC samples that were manually labeled to capture these six layers and white matter. And then we were able to do differential gene expression to get like a, um, a gene expression uh, profile of each of these layers. So that was like the exciting work that was done in this project. Um, so then moving and then I guess moving on, we um, have a new project where we also did uh, spatial transcriptomics in the DLPFC but we used um, data-driven clustering. So uh, kind of a question we were like, uh, had was like, okay, we have these clusters. How do we make sure that they actually like map to the layers? Like that's what we were interested in capturing. Like how, how are, are these data-driven clusters capturing the layers? Um, so basically what we relied upon is this method. And this is what we're gonna be talking about today is spatial, spatial registration. Um, so basically what this does is it's going to like compare how similar the gene expression profiles are between like two groups. So either like our manual annotation in our reference group to our new data, kind of like the query data set. And it's, it's here, it's like these um, data-driven clusters that we got with base space, but this can be a variety of things. And you can also do this with single nucleus data, but basically asking, does the gene expression of one group here being this like cluster, how well does it map match this other group. So we do that by doing an enrichment analysis, um, like looking for your enriched genes in each of these layers. So for instance, comparing the expression of layer five against the expression of all the rest of the spots, um, seeing what genes are enriched in just layer five. Um, and then you have statistics for that. Basically um, take those two statistics and compare that to the um, two statistics for your new data and get a correlation. Um, so you do that for all the pairs across the two data sets, right? And you end up with a table that looks like this. So these green and purple heat maps you might have seen if you've been um, uh, seen any of our work with like the spatial data. Um, but basically like these really deep green spots, that means that they have like really positive correlations. So between here, this like one cluster, this spatial domain 07, which was a cluster we found, really highly correlates with layer one is basically like the conclusion we can draw here. And so we're able to kind of like map our new data back to our old data and see how they compare and contrast and where these data match up. Um, so this is like the big concept here. Um, any questions? Cause I know this is a little tricky. Yeah, right. yeah I have a question. Right. Um, what is the, um, so the, there's colors on the, on the y-axis of the heat map here, um, what is domain color? Yeah, so domain, this is like specific to um, the visualizations here. So the domains were these um, like clusters that we found using the, this base space tool. So we're calling them spatial domains because um, they're not exactly the histological layers. Um, so basically we assign them a color. So for instance, this blue color here, um, is our spatial domain six. So that's this blue color. And then the second color, which is the layer annotation, matches up with the, the colors that we used in that original project. Um, so it matches these colors on the Y axis here. So these colors map the visualizations here. These colors match these colors, match these colors. That's So it's just the aid for um, to like help the visualizations match up. Doesn't really have to do with like the, the, the correlation values. Um, cool. uh, I have a question. I don't if you if if you don't know the type, that's fine because it's more of a biological question. It seems like you're getting layers two, three, and then a layers three, four. It's really the layers three, four. Is that were you guys expecting this, or is this just need to be fine tuned? Or yeah, so this is maybe a little bit. Uh, so for this specifically, this is like. Uh, layer seven. So this is like going to be very specific to the work that we did in the spatial DL PFC project. But basically the thought was, okay, we have six layers plus white matter, probably seven clusters will reiterate that pattern, right? So this was actually trying that with just seven, uh, seven clusters. But what we found is that it was not fine enough resolution. It was picking up, like KJ just pointed out, that it wasn't differentiating between two and three and three and four. We were getting some overlapping here. Um, so we actually found that K of nine, I think it's in here. Um, K of nine actually did a better job of, 
uh, finding like a one-to-one -one match for the layers. Basically what we identified was also like this uh, like vascular layer in the middle of layer one. So layer one splits and has this really thin vascular layer. And then, oh, sorry, my zoom is in the way. Um, splits the layer one into this vascular layer and like, like layer one. And then we get like a one-to-one -one match across our layers and then white matter actually splits again. So this is kind of like more, this was like the, the, the resolution that we found like reiterated that like classical pattern better. Um, and like has that one to one match across the layers. So, yeah, a little unexpected, but we found this new cool thing. Um, yeah, so this is like layer is pretty cool. Uh, have you been able to to reanalyze the, or is this kind of what you're doing, uh, Kristen and Leo's work, where you're looking at just the layer one and just the white matter to see if you like just looking at expression, picking out these two kind of things, in or is this technically that data you're re looking at? Um, so like we defined here and basically like, I mean, we have the, um, we have like the gene expression and like the differential gene expression. And we do find that this layer is like really enriched in like CLDN5 and like other like endothelial like cell type markers, um, if that's what you're asking. So like we do have, like because we can separate this out as like clusters and just look at these spots, we can like look at their gene expression profile. And that does seem to hold like, um, yeah, that up. was what you could if you went back to the same tissue slides, or I, I guess these are like like the same slides that Leo and Kristen looked at to see if in the light white the layer one and the white matter you're picking up the same thing as these new data because are, are these not new data? Uh, this is the this is the this is the new data. Um, so like. We also, I mean, we have like um, similar slides with like, uh, we have like Visium IF, or not, not IF, we have fish, uh, like RNA scope. And like, we are seeing similar, like we do okay. get like a nice bright spot for like our endothelial markers there. Yeah. So you, fish, so you looked at fish to look at that. I was just curious if, if, if you were able to pick it out with like just expression too and these other ones, but if you've done fish, that's more. Technically, that's better. So okay, there yeah, I think other... there's some imaging data that I think is supports this. I don't have that here, uh, but um, yeah, but this was like a cool, cool finding, and like um, that, like we're able to reliably pull that out, and, and that'll help us like define like what we're looking for, like layer one. Like it helps refine like what layer one is. Um, but I didn't. This isn't this. Uh, like we, I'll do a deep dive on this. I think I'm going to do a Liber seminar coming up. Um, on like this whole project. So like we can get into all the nitty gritty of that then. I was gonna, so like today I wanna talk specifically about like how to do this spatial registration. I think that this is like a cool example of like what you can find and like um, how like an application of that, um, but we're gonna go over how to do this. Um, so um, I guess any more content, like questions about the overarching concept or like uh, of this? Um, uh, is the underlying a K mean? Is this a K means cluster, a, a nearest neighbor? Or are you about to say? Um, so uh, I'm not going to talk about the clustering today, um, but it's like base base that uses, um, I forget the, ex I'm not too, I'm not up on the, I don't, I guess like I'll get back to you on that one. So, yeah, that's, that's um, yeah. All right, cool. Um, um, I I had a quick question. Yeah. So so I saw in the previous slide that you had a sample of twelve, but you don't have twelve layers. I'm not too like sure about like how like this stuff works. Pretty much, I'm still learning it, so I'm kind of just curious about how that works. So, so we like, have twelve in this in this study. We had twelve different samples. So this is one sample. So we had like 12 of these slices of brain that we applied mm. this to. This is just one representative section. Um, so there's 12 of these guys that have the same type of data that we kind of like can like um, use all together. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and then in the, the new project, we have 30. So it's like different slices of brain that look a little different. Um, okay, let me get out of there. All right, so today we're going to be um, going over the process of spatial registration. Let's see, I gotta make the zoom smaller, it's driving me crazy. Okay. 
Okay, so the tools that we're gonna need is, or we're going to need, oh, got into our little too quick. Um, we're going to need a spatial, the spatial LABD package. So a lot of the, um, data we're going to use is straight out of spatial LABD. Um, so interested in like, there's lots and lots of new stuff in here, but um, one thing you can do is like access the, um, you can access the data both from the first study with the 12 samples and then from our new study, all that data is going to be accessible through this pack, this R package. Um, and then there's also all the tools that you need to do a lot of the analyses contained in that paper, including all of the stuff that has to do with registration. So um, all of these functions down here, registration, um, are going to be relevant for our uh, uh, spatial registration. So let's actually go to R now. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is just like load up. Um, today we're going to do we're going to spatially register single nucleus data. I was poking around online trying to find an example of. Uh, Spatial, uh, spatial DLP of C data that wasn't our data and I could not find any. So uh, I thought it'd be maybe like more applicable for people to check out. Um, you might use like a single cell experiment. That might be a more common example. There's more of these data sets out there. Um, so we're gonna need the spatial LABD package and the single cell experiment package. Um, I guess like a note back to that um, is that like doing this between a spatial experiment and a single cell experiment are like, it's very similar. It's a very similar process. Um, the same steps should work just fine. Um, okay, so we're gonna load up those packages. And then, um, so again, I mentioned that we need two data sets, right? Like we need the reference data set. That's like what we're going to map to. So we're going to use just like that original 12 samples with the um, with like the layers. So we're going to use the fetch data um, function out of spatial LABD to load that data. Um, Okay, so basically that is going to um, load up. Um, so this modeling results is the results from the uh, 12 sample data. And basically what this contains is um, three different models um, and it is all the differential expression results from that first um, So it contains three different models that we uh, that were done on like that first round of data. So it has an ANOVA enrichment and a pairwise differential expression across all of those different layers. Today, we're gonna to focus on just the enrichment ones and we can take a look at what that looks like. It's basically just, just like a big table. Um, is a big table of all of the statistics related to that differential expression analysis that was done and published with that paper. Um, you can also explore all of these online on the Shiny app, but this is what they'll look like when you download them from the uh, with using fetch data. And basically what it is, it's like the T statistic for white matter for this first gene versus, so how like, what's the differential expression result of white matter versus everything else? So we have the T statistic, the p-value, the FDR, and then information about the gene, the ensemble, and the gene symbol here. So it's a pretty simple table and those results. And we'll be using the enrichment results for our spatial um, registration. So this first thing is like get reference data. Okay, so then the second part be our query data. So imagine that this is your data. This is the data that you're interested in actually finding more about the spatial, like finding more about like the spatial, I guess, like origin of like these different clusters. Um, so we're going to actually use um, the MATTRANS uh, 10x um, single nucleus DLPFC data. 
Um, so we're going to take the clusters in his data, the different cell type populations and ask, hey, where were those like, where were those maybe like most concentrated in the DLPFC layers? And um, that's like the question we're going to ask today. So we're going to um, access that data. I'm gonna, this is more complicated. So I'm just gonna copy paste this in here. But um, so this 10 is available off, you can use BioC Cache to download this off of the GitHub. Um, um, so this is gonna load up this SCE DLPFC TRAN. Um, so this is a single cell experiment object. Uh, take a look. Um, yeah, so we have 33,000 cells all right, 33,000 genes and 11,000 nuclei. Um, and we have all these different assays. Um, so that's that's the data. So, and then like what we're interested in is like the population, the cell type populations. So let's look at what is, oh, that's not what I wanted. All right, it's gonna think about that. But really what we want is, cell type. All right, well, why that choose through that? Um, all right, we'll start over. That's fine. Um, The nice thing of having the cached data that you downloaded, you don't need to download it again. It's already in your computer. Nice. Um, so Leah, am I able to just uh... You still need to run the uh, lines 13 to 18. Okay. But it's not gonna download it anymore. Okay, cool. I guess we could have had this over here earlier. All right, so we have our SE um, deal. Okay, so maybe we should have taken a peek at the column data. Um, so some important things that we're going to need to know in here, um, we need to know they have a donor column, that's important for a spatial registration coming up, um, and then we also have a cell type column. So this is the, the cell type labels for um, different populations in this data. Um, so like these cell types are what we're interested in mapping back to our layers from the spatial data. Um, so let's take a look at those. Um, yeah, so we have a bunch of different populations, so we have astrocytes, and then a couple different subtypes of excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, and then we have some other glias, macrophage, microglia, mural cells, oligos, OPCs, and T cells. Louisa, uh, is this um, is this the manual annotations that that the people made for? Is is that how you got these cell types? Or yeah, so this, this is a different process. Basically, annotating cell type populations is a its own its own thing. Um, the annotations that I was talking about earlier for those spots, that's going to be in our layer modeling results. Um, so those different layers so are actually like correspond to this data. So this is the reference, which is going to be those manually annotated layers. This is what we're going to compare the single cell cell types back to. Okay, so the, these are the this what we're looking at right now is the predicted. Yeah, so we're not, in, I guess, like, we're the cell types were already predicted based on some other, another process and looking at, like, marker genes. That's another whole topic. Um, so, like, we can just assume that these cell types are good and that these layers were the ones manually annotated out of this spatial data. So, okay. like, kind of going into this process, not, like, reevaluating these, I guess, like, we're gonna learn more about these cell types is, is the goal of what I'm doing right now. Um, 
but the these layers are like these are the reference these are like what we are going to like learn use to learn more about like the query data which is going to be like our uh cell data like the single cell data does that does that answer your question yeah yeah i, I was just wondering where where, where the the data was like which which data was coming from where but thank you okay cool um yeah so kind of like the the point is that like this is an example we're going to use uh the uh trans data as an example but kind of imagine as if like this was your own single cell data that we wanted to learn more about spatial so that would kind of be the application so this is kind of like our input this is this is like our our reference this is like the stable one um Okay, so we have our data, we've taken a look. These are our different cell types that we want to learn more about. Um, and one note here is that there's a couple rare cell types. They're gonna be a little too rare to uh, like compute good data off of. So we have like only seven cells in inhibitory eight or in inhib E, um, you know, there's only nine T cells. So some of these are gonna be too small cell type populations to like, um, that we feel good about. Um, we recommend that you're gonna need populations over 10. So it's not just this, these also have to, they're also going to be grouped by donor. Um, so just we'll keep that in mind. But the process, uh, the, the functions that we have in spatial LIBD are going to take care of that for you. Um, so the first step that we have to do is get the enrichment statistics for the single cell data in the same way that we have them for the, um, the layers in our reference data. Um, so the first step is like, we call it spatial register. It's a, uh, let me pull up the, the reference here. Um, it's going to be, we're gonna use, we need to get registration stats enrichment and kind of the couple steps that you have to do is you have first have to pseudobulk the data. Um, so pseudobulking is basically kind of adding the counts across cell type and in this, or like cell type, type to have like one single column. Basically, single cell data is pretty sparse. We want just like one point of data for each gene. Uh, what is it? What is an astrocyte? So we're going to like um, add all of like, for instance, add all of the counts for astrocytes together for like one representation, one representative like astrocyte column. Um, so we're actually going to do that by cell type and donor. So we're going to have way less columns. Um, and that's going to help eliminate some of the sparsity in our single cell data. Um, so the process is we pseudobulk, and then we have to build a model. Um, so the model is going to be built over what we consider like the registration variable, and that's going to be cell type. That's the um, what we're interested in. It's going to compute block correlation, and then it's going to do enrichment stats. So there's like a lot going on. There's a lot of steps. But basically what we've summed them all up into this one nice function registration wrapper, which is just going to do all of that for us based on a little bit of information we need to give it. And then it is also going to um, uh, compute all of the enrichment statistics and other, it does the ANOVA and the pairwise as well, but we're just going to use the enrichment. So this is like the key, if you're going to do this, this is like a key function and like makes your life way easier. Um, So we can look at maybe the help for registration wrapper to guide us through. Guide us through filling us out. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, again, provide for convenience. It runs all of the functions for, for computing modeling results, um, useful for finding marker genes, um, and then is like used for performing spatial registration through layer stat core. So that's gonna be our next step. Um, so let's, um, let's do this. Um, we can call this SCE model. Okay, so var registration is the variable that we're interested in registering over, um, which we'll use to compute the relevant statistics. Um, so we're interested in doing that over cell type. 
um, cause that's like the variable we're interested in learning more about um, of our sample IDs. So this is, um, we want to um, control for any like differences that occurred like between the samples. In this case, sample is, um, is, is by donor. Um, so we'll add that. Um, covariates. Uh, I, wait, okay, I actually don't think that we need to add any covariates for this example. Um, so then gene ensemble is the, um, the row data column that the ensemble gene IDs are in. So let's take a look at our row data for that. Um, okay, so is gene ID. And then gene name. So this helps like just format the, the plot correctly in the end. Um, and then one thing that I have found is that, uh, so right now our SCE object, the column names are the gene symbols and we need them to be the ensemble IDs for this process to go smoothly. So we'll change that. Um, so actually, Um, so now if we look at the row data, we'll see that that, oh wait, oh, wanted that to be gene ID actually. Okay, so we changed the row names to the ensemble IDs. Um, so you always gotta be watching out for that. And then um, another, an error I found when I was prepping for this, but we'll, we'll run it now so I can show you what the issue is. Um, so it's going to make the pseudobulk objects. So again, it's going to add over um, the categories that are cell type and donor. Um, and then it's gonna like check to see if any of those groups are below 10. So 10 is like the recon recommended minimum number of cells to do pseudobulking for. So it's trying to drop 13 groups that are below minimum cells, um, below the expressed genes. And then it's, um, so, normalized expression. So these first steps are the ones that come out of the registration pseudobulking process. And then here we're entering with a creating model matrix. And this is where we hit a problem. The resulting model is not full rank. You might have some bar registration levels that are empty. So the registration levels are, again, if we check, is cell type. So in this um, BLPFC, um, Uh, actually, so SE DLPFC uh, cell type is actually a, a factor. Um, so we can like you know, levels is a factor. So like it can is is contains these levels. Um, so when this happens and it drops these, um, it drops some of them. Like some of the populations, some of the cell types just get dropped completely because there's so few. Remember when we looked at the table? Um, so it ends up with empty levels. Um, so this is maybe something that we could uh, update in the package to be able to handle this better. But basically what I, um, how to fix this is to just convert that to um, a character. Um, so it's not a factor anymore. Um, so that, that'll avoid that, but um, we could maybe improve that to, to have a step where it um, drops empty levels. Um, um, yeah, so this takes a second. It doesn't take too long with this data, um, but it's gonna go through all the different steps that um, are involved in creating these, these statistics. Um, the wrapper makes it easy. Um, it runs all of these guys. So yeah, runs um, runs enrichment statistics. And it's also going to do the pairwise model um, down here. So um, it um, produces a, an object that is similar to um, the ones that we downloaded with fetch data. 
Um, so we have ANOVA enrichment and pairwise. And then if we look at the head of enrichment, it's the same table, right? But now we have statistics that are for our cell types and not for the layers, right? So we have the T stats for the astrocytes, T stats for excitatory, um, and the, the T statistics for the genes are what we're going to use to compute the correlations. So this is the output. This is information. This is also very useful information if you wanted to like investigate like what genes are you know actually enriched for. So like you know that's a whole another thing to explore. Um, you can look at like the top enriched genes for the different groups and learn more about them that way. Um, but we're gonna move on to the correlation part. Um, so any any questions on the enrichment, like getting to the enrichment statistics? All right, cool. So what would what would like an example covariate here be? Would that be like if you were joining um, multi, like if you had your single cell data? Yeah, maybe if you were concerned about like uh, age that, or something. Uh, yeah, like age, um, sex might be a good one. Um, yeah, so like things that you control for in like a differential expression. So here, like um, I know that these, so it, it kind of is like based on your knowledge of like what is in the experiment. Um, if we go back to the column data for the DLPOC trend, like I know like they did on purpose, like made these all pretty similar donors. So like um, these are like, I think actually, actually I do think that there are some, um, there might be some female donors in here. So that might've been like, if we were, no, these are all male. Oh. Um, but if you would have had like um, female and male samples, which, you know, hopefully experiment has, um, you you could control for like sex or age. Um, but I think that that's like, you know, it, it does take a second to like think about um, what would be like a good differential expression model. You know, that's all its own can of worms, um, yep. but that, is yeah adding covariates for that like here I was just trying to show like a simple example and we know that the uh, donors in this experiment were all like pretty similar on like by design um so uh, but yeah good point and so then is the pseudo bulking only being applied within sample for the spatial data or is it being applied within sample for both data sets? So the pseudobulking was, so the same process was performed on the um, spatial data and that's how we got to this, this up here. So we kind of oh, got through right. that okay. again. This is just already, like already computed and stored for us. Um, these are like the statistics that were published with that paper. So this is a way to access that, but it was the same procedure. Um, yeah, so we're kind of like, you know, doing that same procedure, but just on like our, our new data set. Gotcha. So if you were handling a new spatial data set, you would also have to run this with your spatial. Exactly. Data. Yeah. Oh, got it. Okay, thanks. Um, cool. So yeah, so now we have our enrichment results. Um, so what we have to do to run, um, so the next thing we're going to run is like layer stack for, um, uh, um, Okay, so what it wants is, uh, I guess we can look at the help for that. Um, so it takes the statistics and then it takes the modeling. Okay, so it takes the statistics from your query data. So for us, it's this SC data set. It takes the modeling results from, um, so this is like the reference. So it takes the modeling results from our reference. Here, it actually would fetch the data that we fetched above, but I just wanted to walk everybody through that. So by default, it's actually going to just like grab those manual layers. Um, and then uh, it uh, you can set it to do like reverse correlation. And then there's like, by default, it uses all genes. We have found that it's like less noisy to use the top 100. Um, it's like, uh, less noisy results, but we've also found that they're pretty uh, stable, whichever you use. Um, so this first one is, it wants the statistics and that is a data frame um, with en ensemble IDs. And then it also, it wants the T statistics and the column names are clusters for cell types. So we're gonna have to extract the T statistics out of our modeling results. Um, so I think we could go like 
SCET stats. Um, um, so we want to, again, if we look at the head of this, um, it's going to have all of these different columns. It has the T statistics for each cell type. It has the P values for each cell type, the FD, the corrected P values, so the FDRs, and then it has our information about our ensemble and genes. We just want the T statistics and we want them just named uh, by the cell type. So we're going to get rid of this T stat label. Um, so we're going to use grep. Um, enrichment, all names. There's, it might be useful to um, add a function into our uh, It might be useful to add a function into the package that does this for you, um, but yeah, it's just going to grab these first ones. But this is this is the how we'll do this for now. Um, so then, if we look at the head of this, we just have our T statistic columns, and we're going to rename our T statistic the columns of that. Um, Are we doing on time? Okay, we're okay. Um, we'll use some of the skills we learned about uh, G sub and from uh, Hedia last week. Um, so we want to get rid of that T stat. Um, uh, we're going to get rid of that little T stat uh, syntax. Oh, wait, X is missing with the default. What did I miss? Oh, nothing. We're going to place that with nothing in G sub. So now we have this, this, this cleaner table where this is just the T statistics. Call, row names are our ensemble IDs, and the column names are our cell type um, labels. OK, so now we're ready to run uh, layer stat core. So these SCE's T stats are in our stats. Um, our modeling results. I think we had them saved as layer modeling. Um, by default, it's going to grab the mod. It's going to grab the enrichment. The names of modeling results one is enrichment, um, and we'll use the top one hundred genes. Top n equals one hundred. Um, you can call this layer or because we're finding the correlations between our SCE cell types and the layers. So we're gonna end up with this table of correlations. And this is also going to be already clustered for us. So it kind of makes this, oh. Ooh, is this not the right? Ooh. Wait, one second. Try just the default there. Hmm. Wait, I'm not quite sure where um, this input is not looking uh, like I expected. I'm not quite sure where things went wrong here. Um, You're doing the Novo? I thought you, you wanted to do the enrichment. Oh, yeah, it might be. Uh, yeah, I guess like I just relied on the, the model model type. We'll do. Um,
There we go. Okay, good call, Leo. I guess, yeah. Um, I thought the default was set to be enrichment, but um, I guess, okay, so warning to be careful about that. Um, so as you can see here, we can kind of sense from how R outputs this in these various colors that we have like some positive correlations and, you know, some, you can kind of see a little bit in this table, but we'll, we can um, explore these outputs. Um, so we can create a layer stat core plot. Um, Okay, so then it's going to create this uh, green and purple table. Let's see, can I zoom in on this and then? Okay, cool. You guys can see the the plot, right? That's the whole screen. Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, so basically, this is those correlation values represented in this heat map. Um, so we have our cell types along the the x axis here, and our layers on the y. And basically, green is our high positive correlation, and purple is our negative correlations. So basically, where we see dark green, that's where things kind of match up. So we think, see things like oligos are mapping to our white matter. That's kind of expected. Um, oligos are glial cells, and they're found more in the white matter. Um, astrocytes to layer one, that's also expected. And then we see our different excitatory um, cells map to different parts of the uh, different layers. So this is also excited, like we know that excitatory neurons like are like, um, I guess like more discrete, like different populations are located across the different layers. So that's like also interesting. And then we also know that our inhibitory cells are kind of like, they're like less, they're like not super specific. They're, they're, this is like how you can interpret this is that like, these just kind of exist everywhere. They're not really like specific to one part. Um, you can see that they're a little bit more like associated with our gray matter and like these like inner cortical layers and less with the um, the white matter, but it's not as strong as a pattern as we see with the excitatory one. So this is actually like aligns with what we know about like biologically what's happening in the brain. So we can kind of like see that confirmed in the gene expression. So that's pretty neat. Um, um, cool. Um, so yeah, uh, that's like the same type of plot that I was showing you guys earlier with the purple and the green. Um, you can get fancy and annotate it with colors. We're not going to do that today. Um, we're hoping to make that like a, a practical tool in the, um, we're hoping to update the plotting function to make it have those annotations baked in, but we don't quite have that quite yet. Um, and then the last thing you can do is use these correlation values to create annotations for your cell types. So for instance, like those excitatory neurons that are like pretty interesting. It might like right now they're just labeled like A through F, like the excitatory ones. It might be more informative to add like the cell type, um, like the layers to them. So that, that's for instance, like something we did in the spatial DLPFC project. So we can use, um, what is it, annotate? Uh, wait, I might have to go check the... Let's look at our reference here. Annotate registered clusters, that's what it's called. Um, you can look at the help. Um, yeah, so we've completed the enrichment T statistics and we've used registration lot wrapper. Um, we can use uh, this this function helps you interpret the matrix and assign layer labels to your clusters. Um, so it takes our core st stats layers, and then there's some different thresholds that we can set. I'll, let's check out what this does first. Um, um, so basically what this function does, it returns a little table where each of the clusters gets a layer of confidence. So basically like, does it have a registration, it does it have a correlation value over that confidence threshold? If it does, then we're like, okay, we can probably confidently assign that to like one label. And then it also has this cutoff merge ratio where if there's like multiple layers that have positive correlations, are those close enough together in um, correlation that maybe we can consider both? So that's how we end up with like these multiple layers. But more simply, if we think about our plot again, Oligo is like very highly positively correlated with white matter. That's clearly above 0.25. It has a good confidence and we can label it white matter. Um, 
So this is like specifically useful for maybe these excitatory subtypes. Um, so again, excitatory B, uh, this annotation is labeled it as 2, 3. Um, wait, where did my plot go? Um, so let's take a look at our plot a little bigger again. Yeah. Okay, maybe we can just look at it here. But excitatory B, we can see that it has pretty strong correlation for two and three, and those are similar. So the little um, algorithm in our annotation has given it two and three, which looking at our plot, I think is reasonable. So those cutoffs you can tune, um, but uh, we think that they're pretty good. So like excitatory C is like just three, and you can see that they're pretty strongly associated with just layer three. So if you wanted to, you could then perhaps label this excitatory layer two, three, or excitatory layer three, um, and so on. Um, so that's kind of the whole process and how you could like use these different tools out of spatial LIBD to like um, match and label maybe like new uh, cell type clusters. But um, for instance, for a spatial DLPFC, we had those um, like base space data driven clusters. So we had, were able to uh, give them the like layer context using the same exact process. So that was a big, big part of that. Um, if you're interested, you know, check out the preprint. Um, so yeah, that's the um, that's the full process. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, can you go back to the spatial library uh, documentation website? Yeah. And then, so if you scroll all the way up, you'll notice that the version name, uh, number changed while you were presenting. So you click on articles, you'll see now your, your vignette is there. Um, yeah, so I made it cool. Yeah. Um, and if you wait 40 minutes, it'll change, the version number will change again. And the new version number doesn't have those bugs that you were noticing. Oh, cool, sweet. <laughs> you know, you don't, have, fast. you don't have to rename the the row names anymore, and it'll automatic. You don't have to use the as character trick anymore. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I was noticing that. Yeah, those little ones that I was trying to get this going. So yeah, I think that'll make everything a little more user friendly. Um, great. Thanks for doing that, Leo. Um, yeah, so the, the lesson I like taught today is like it's it, the code should be all be in here. So this will be a good reference. Um, oh, and here's a nice, prettier version of that plot that we were trying to look at. Um, great. Um, yes, it is 10. So I don't know if anybody has any last minute questions, but um, yeah, there's lots to learn about this whole topic. Um, this is a very useful process uh, to like, um, you know, uh, kind of compare and contrast um, these data sets. Um, yeah, cool. If anybody wants to talk more about that, I'm happy to happy to help. Thanks, Louise. I have a friend.